But uh, let's keep it all moving. Let's welcome my beautiful wife. Come on, welcome her this morning. Oh, hello. Look at you all. You look amazing. Okay, you guys can relax. I'm going to do the work here. Actually, the Holy Spirit's going to do the work here this morning. Amazing. I'm just going to pray. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Spirit of God, we thank you for the outpouring of your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your love that never fails. And God, we thank you and we declare a fresh move of your unfailing love upon the earth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So good, amazing. Well, what a privilege to be able to share the Word of God at Freedom Conference. Who's having fun? Can you believe that we get to, on a Wednesday morning, come together with some of the best people in the nation and worship the Lord? Like, we should be pinching ourselves. This is a great privilege, so it's very exciting. Uh, The title of my message this morning, and really what I want you to catch, because I believe it's a message from the heart of the Father to us. The title of the message is A Revival of Unfailing Love. And I believe we're moving into a time where the love of God is gonna be poured out in new measure. And the only antidote to some of the traumas and problems and unfixable issues that people are facing, churches are facing, nations are facing, is an outpouring of the unconditional, expansive love of God, His grace and His unmerited favour. And that's what I wanna speak about this morning. I do wanna touch on a scripture that keeps coming up prophetically in this conference. And I wanna touch on it because I felt the Lord speak it to me last week and then Pastor Julie Oldfield prophesied out of this scripture on Sunday evening and then Tim keeps mentioning it every time it's up here. And it's really the story of Jacob traveling from one place to another running from the house of his father and mother, everything that he had known after deceiving his dad for the blessing, (laughs) like a good godly man, (laughs) praise the Lord, Um, running from everything that he had known to another place. And I just really felt the Lord impress this story on my heart last week, because who knows that the body of Christ is in transition? Who knows that the church across the planet is moving from one place to another place. And we're not there, and we're not there. (laughs) We're kind of in the middle, right? We're in transition. Corporately, the body of Christ is in transition. Personally, many of us may be in transition. And transition, transition can feel unsettling, confusing, discombobulating, (laughs) just had to get that word in there, (laughs) and completely unsettling. And Jacob was certainly in transition. He was moving from everything he'd known and a mother that just absolutely adored and fussed over him. (laughs) And you know, he was the favorite to this new land and he was walking, moving through desert places and unknown lands. And in his exhaustion, in the transition, he lay down and he put his head upon the rock. And who knows, that's a good place to put our head when we're tired and we're in transition. To put our head upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And I just wonder if that's exactly where the Lord wants us in this season. Somewhat bewildered, but desperately dependent. Laying down and putting our head upon the simplicity and the firm foundations of the rock of Jesus Christ. And right in the middle, in this place of transition, What do you know? The heavens opened. And Jacob said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. 
And I wanna say to us this morning, as the church corporately and as individuals moving through transition, surely the Lord is in this place and we did not know it. In fact, this is none other than the house of God. And perhaps God has us right where he wants us. And in this place that the Lord was, there was a stairway and the angels descended from heaven to earth and the Lord was at the top of the stairway. And at the top of the stairway, the Lord boomed down from heaven covenantal promises. Covenantal promises are promises that weren't based on Jacob's performance. Lucky that. They weren't even based on his purity of heart because he'd been duplicitous and deceptive. They were based on the love of the Father and his commitment to his people. And right now, as a church, in all our mess, (laughs) in all our issues across the globe, and who knows there's some issues in the church right now, We have a covenantal father who is committed to his church and is committed to his people regardless of how well they're going or whether or not they're getting it together. He's committed because he's made a promise of unfailing love. And, you know, the the promise that I'm hearing resound loud and clear from the father is this promise of his love never failing us. In our wounds, in our mistakes, in our confusion, that we are found and rescued from this place of unfailing love. We've been hearing a bit about trauma from Pastor Mike. (laughs) And you know, not just Pastor Mike, you only have to open your newspapers or you know, to hear about trauma, trauma, trauma. And certainly as an inner city pastor of 22 years, praise the Lord, (laughs) um, I've had my fair share of trauma. And it's not a subject that's unfamiliar to me. And you know, that's on top of being the daughter of a bottle shop owner who was serious about sampling his products every single night. Uh, And all the wild mess that goes with such behavior. And so I've known my fair share of trauma. But I've discovered it's not just me. Trauma seems to be everywhere at the moment. It doesn't seem to just be reserved for those who have gone through a war zone. It just seems to be absolutely everywhere. And you know, my son has been studying the poets of old and I remembered he's doing year 12, Sammy, he's doing an exam today, pray for him, right? Um, and I remember when I was studying the poets of old and one of the poems of Coleridge and you know, he was talked about this tormented ocean mariner, rhyme of the ancient mariner. Who remembers that poem? The rhyme of the ancient mariner. And in that poem, the mariner says, water, water everywhere and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. And this year I've been thinking, trauma, trauma, (laughs) everywhere and all our hopes did shrink. Trauma, trauma everywhere, Lord, give us a drink. (laughs) So, I began to kind of really cry out to the Lord on this issue of trauma, and I'm continuing to cry out to the Lord on this issue because it is everywhere, and we need to have answers as the church, and we need to point the way forward. Before our women's conference, someone sent me a scripture, and this scripture has captured my heart. It ministered to me before the conference. I preached out of it at the conference and I actually haven't been able to get away from it. So for those of you who are at our women's conference, you're getting a double dose. But I believe it is a critical scripture for now and an answer and a signpost for a world in trauma. It's from Lamentations 3 and it's from the prophet Jeremiah who was in extreme trauma, by the way. 
He was a prophet, an amazing prophet. Don't be shamed if you are experiencing trauma or you've been through it. The prophet Jeremiah had extreme trauma because of the incredible oppression and suffering that the Israelites had faced under the Babylonians. We've been hearing about it from Pastor Mike. They were afflicted, they were in anguish, they were suffering and trauma has a voice. It has a voice of hopelessness, of despair, of grief, and no way out. And we travel through Lamentations, and it's a book of woe and despair and grief, and the prophet's crying out his woes and despairs, which is a good thing to do, by the way, and to get them out on paper. And we've been hearing about that from, from Mike, to pour it out before the Lord, talk to him about it. It's a good thing to do. And so Jeremiah's crying, it, crying out. And we read in Lamentations 3.20, this prophet says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. That's a yucky taste, right? The bitterness and the gall. Some of you know what that feels like. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. He's remembering and he's listening to the voice of trauma. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. But right at this point, in the intersection between Lamentations 3.20 and Lamentations 3.21, the prophet finds a way out of trauma. And I believe it is the only way out for the world that we are currently in and the generation that we are currently in. Jeremiah says, yet this I call to mind. Trauma ruminates on the wounds, the hurt, the past. We have to have something to call to mind in the midst of our ruminations. Jeremiah said, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love. Other translations are unfailing love. I was speaking to a theologian psychologist during the week who says it's attachment love. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Trauma is not going to consume us. Trauma is not going to consume our generation. Trauma is not going to consume the body of Christ. Trauma is not going to consume our nation. Because of what? Because of the Lord's great love. We are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They don't fail. Unmerited fa favour. Unmerited grace. Unmerited love. Good old-fashioned grace. Can we bring it back to the church, people? Good old-fashioned grace. Come on, let's see it come back in power. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Trauma and despair ruminate, but the prophet Jeremiah learnt to intercept the ruminations with a meditation. And the meditation was on the unfailing love of God. And just as a takeaway for us in this conference, we're hearing incredible teaching, we're experiencing amazing ministry. But if we don't move deeper every day into a personal and living revelation of the Father's personal love for us, his unfailing love for us, we are not going to be able to hold or sustain the work that gets accomplished here. Sorry, but that's a reality. We have to hold it with a personal walk with the Father's unfailing love for us. Our God, our personal God, meditating on this love that never fails, that works all things together for good. 
Uh, last week, how am I going? Can't see Mike. Can I have a little bit more time? Am I good? Okay, five minutes. Um, last week, a few of our teams sat in the Australian Church Mental Health Summit. Any other pastors in that summit? No? Um, it was great and very interesting. A lot of different denominations were represented. We learned, most of you know this, one in five Australians have been diagnosed with a mental health condition. That's only a diagnosis, one in five. That's a lot. We also learnt that even secular research shows us that at the root of mental health issues is a relational issue. And mental health cannot be fixed outside the context of relationship. As the church, are we not positioned to be the answer? And you know the other interesting research that came out, this is secular research that the church, this mental health church organisation has put together. In therapeutic relationships, do you know what the best indicator of success in the relationship is? It's not the technique of therapy, it's the relationship with the therapist. It's relationship people. We have to learn to reattach dislocated sons and daughters with the unconditional love of the Father. And as the church, we must become safe containers for the love of Jesus. Safe containers for the love of the Father. The Lord says to us in Romans 8, we're moving now, Old Testament, New Testament, it's everywhere really, if you look. Romans 8, who could ever divorce us? from the endless love of God's anointed one. Absolutely no one, no nothing. Nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love towards us. Troubles, no. Pressures, no. Problems, unable to come between us and heaven's love. Persecutions, deprivations, dangers, death threats, no. They are impotent to hinder the omnipotent love of God. And it goes on. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstance that can weaken his love. There is no power above, beneath, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Freedom Conference, we must, in the midst of people's ruminations, in their despair, in their hopelessness, trauma and hurt, we must intercept it with the revelation of the unfailing love of God that works all things together for good. And we must become safe carriers of the unconditional, unmerited grace, favour and love of God. I'm a poet, so I'm going to end with some poetry that articulates this. All right, here we go, straight from my personal journal. All right, and amid the ruminations, we find our way out, calling to mind a greater love than all the trauma about. The greater love becomes the ladder from where we begin our climb Knowing our future is in our maker's hands, hands divine, not mine. And love begins to infuse our soul and sings through trauma's cry, a song to quiet trauma's torment with love instead of why. And because of this love, we're not consumed. No, not eaten up, not finished, not over, not done with, perhaps we've just got up. Love awakens this present dawn and claims the new day. Love washes what's tired and worn, the author, the finisher of our play. Love becomes the sound that spins our world around and all of trauma's out of tune cries are drowned as love resounds. And what if this is the answer? this immense love divine that calls our heart and woos our wounds and becomes 
our brand new wine. So if we must be drunk to drown trauma's woes, let's be drunk on unfailing love, immersion from head to toes. So find me in the river of love that never fails. And let this be my song, now drowning trauma's wails. Can we just take a moment and stand? And just as Brendan ministers to the, through the keys, as ministers, as leaders, as the body of Christ, I want us to open our hearts afresh to the unfailing love of God, the unconditional love of God, not just for ourselves, but for the desperately pained world around us. It's the only way forward. It is the only way. Thank you, Lord. God, we say yes. We say yes to an outpouring, a fresh outpouring of Your unfailing love. God, the deeper magic, the sacrificial love, Father. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Father. We say yes and we pray right now, God, for the winds of grace, the winds of hope, the winds of love to come and heal our wounds, revive our souls, energize our call, excite our hearts and give us passion. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.